Well, hey there, good morning, Spotswood. My name is Kyle, and we are so excited that you are worshiping here with us. As always, we have a lot on the horizon, and we have the details you need. Here are your announcements. Well, you don't need me to tell you, but Easter is next week, and we could not be more excited to celebrate a king like no other king, our risen King Jesus. We want you here with us, and we just believe that there are some of your family, friends, coworkers, and neighbors who would love to be here as well if they just knew that they were invited. To help you out, we've created some invite squares that are available in the lobby. Pick up a few on the way out today. Or here's another idea. Many of you have community pages and mom groups that you're a part of. We'd love for you to share our Facebook event with them. To learn more about all of our Easter gatherings and much more, visit spotswood.org slash Easter. Men, a couple of times each year, we gather together as the men of Spotswood for Man Church. Our next gathering is happening less than a month away from now, Sunday, April 21st. Tailgating starts at four in the student building parking lot, and at six, we'll head into the student building for worship and a strong word from Pastor Drew. This is for men of all ages, from the youngest right on up. It's gonna be a fun night, and we're excited to see you there. Middle and high school students, it may just now be spring, but summer is coming, and you know what that means. Camp is just around the corner. This year, we're heading to Watermark for an incredible week together, focusing on the large size of our God. So many things loom large for our teenagers, but if we'll zoom out and see God for who he really is, we'll gain some perspective on our problems and our anxieties will disappear. It's gonna be a great week together and we want you there. The deadline to sign up is this Wednesday, so head on over to spotswood.org slash students to secure your spot today. Well, thanks again, church, for being with us this morning. If you came ready to give, we have a number of easy and safe ways to do so. If you're with us in person, you can drop your gift in a box near your exit, or you can set up a one-time or recurring gift through our app or at spotswood.org slash we also invite you to stay connected with us all week long at Spotswood.org and on Facebook and Instagram at Spotswood News. We love you, church. Now let's get ready to worship together. Good morning, church family. Let's stand. Let's worship together. Sing with me. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea, creation's revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring, every creature unique in the song that it sings. All exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. All powerful, untamable. All shook, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing. Hold every lightning bolt where it should go Or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow Who imagined the sun and gives source to its light Yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night None can fathom indescribable uncontainable you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name you are amazing god sing all powerful untamable all powerful untamable all struck we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim you are amazing, God. Sing that again, church. Indescribable. Indescribable. Uncontainable. 
You place the stars in the sky and you know them by name. You are amazing, God. All powerful, untamable, all struck, we fall to our knees as we humbly proclaim. You are amazing, God. And come thou almighty King, help us thy name to sing, help us to praise, Father It is a joy to have you here with us this morning, Palm Sunday. I want to read a little bit from Luke, because all of us are supposed to be in Luke this month. Isn't that right, Pastor Drew? All right. This is Luke 18. It says, And when Jesus saw that he had become very sorrowful, he said, How hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God for it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God and those who heard it said who then can be saved but he said the things which are impossible with men are possible with God then Peter said see we have left all and followed you so he said to them assured Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come eternal life. It's a good promise. Amen. This morning I was on my way in and I saw a car. Um. And it had, I, I can't remember the exact name, but it had a, had a name, and then it said, in memory of the name, and then it had a junior. And then it had an and. It had the exact same name and the third. And it settled in on me that that person lost their father and their child. And I stopped, I said, Lord, I don't know if that person knows you or if they don't know you. 
But we are constantly surrounded by people like that. And we pass them and we don't, we don't, we don't know what they're going through. We don't know if they're in absolute misery or if they are living the best life you could possibly imagine. But we just continue going. But I truly believe that that person, whether they're saved or not, I believe that they need the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in that kind of situation where you lose a, a parent and a child and you're living your life, I can't imagine the loneliness. They need the promise that the things that are impossible for us, they're, they're possible with God. That one day, if they know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they can see those again. So I don't know where you are, but I want you to know that when Jesus came into Jerusalem, he came leaving a throne, not to step on an earthly one. He came to save you. He came for you and every person that you come in contact with. The ones you love, the ones you can't stand. For all of us. And that's the hope that I hope you see this morning. Father, we want to lift you up this morning because we know that you can do things. You can bring hope to hopeless situations. You can turn graves into gardens. You can turn bones into armies. You can do things that we are not capable of. And God, I'm sure that in a crowd this large, there is somebody who is sitting in this auditorium right now that is struggling. And God, I just pray that you make your presence known to that person, that you love them, that you care about them, and that your love is greater than anything that they could possibly imagine. So great that they are that you are willing to leave your throne and die a death that we deserve. Your love is greater than anything we could possibly imagine. So Lord, as we celebrate this Holy Week, I pray that we keep proper perspective. We are celebrating something we couldn't do for ourselves, and our loving God did it for us. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Church, if you will, stand and continue worshiping with us this morning. You met me at my lowest moment You saw me at my very worst When I expected disappointment Love was all I My sin was deep your grace was deeper my shame was wide your arms were wider my guilt was great your love was greater still you ran to me when i was naked you clothed me in your righteousness You pulled me from the depths of darkness Into your light again Oh, into your light again And my sin was deep Your grace was deeper My shame was wide Your arms were wider My guilt was great your love was greater still my sin was deep your grace was deeper my shame was wide your arms were wider my guilt was great your love was greater still How deep, how wide, how 
should praise him forever and ever amen because of that amen we praise you lord we praise you i can't wait for eternity join the song they're already singing holy 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 are you lord just to bow down before your throne see your face i'll cry out because you're holy 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 are you who have heard well done proclaiming forever that you're the one who's faithful 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 are you
Father God, we praise you today because you are worthy of it all. There truly is no king like King Jesus. And everything that we are should worship you. God, I pray that you are honored today by the singing of your people. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Church, you may be seated. Hey, Smile Squad, Pastor Adam Diamond here from Downtown Community Church. Your team has just finished up doing fantastic work here at this school, um, painting. They painted these walls here just behind me, as well as cleaning, mopping. They've been in some pretty dirty, dirty corners of this school and just blessing them. And trust me when I say that this will go a long way in the community. This will not be forgotten. Your team has served well. They have, they have given glory to God. They have done extremely well. You should be proud of them. And thank you for praying for us and supporting us in this way. You may never see the fruits of these seeds that you have planted, but trust that God will be faithful with them um, and that this will go and help us further our reputation in the community. Thank you so much for your support and your prayers. Take care. Hey there, Spotswood. Matt Leahy here from Kilbride Community Church. I just want to take a moment to say thank you. I can't, <laughs> I can't say that enough. You know, this past week, as you sent up these nine youth and three adults, this missions team, like it has been such a huge blessing, not only to me, but to this little church plant and to the community as a whole. I have seen the Lord break in and work through and, and tear down barriers and walls in ways that I haven't seen before. Uh, in, in even the last four years that we've been doing church here. Uh, and, and you know, God has been using these youth to do just that. I've watched them uh, grow uh, spiritually and, and, and personally. Uh, I've, I've seen them uh, encounter just the hardship of doing ministry here. I've seen them wrestle with just how difficult it is. And I've seen them rejoice in, 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 the, in seeing the Lord work and move in the lives of people, just regular everyday folk here in, in St. John's. And, and I, I, you, you may never see the fruit of this. You may never hear of it, but I want you to know that even though we are geographically separated, we are in this together as a family. And, and you, your church, my brothers and sisters at Spotswood, you are having an internal impact on this community here on an island stuck off in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And so from me to you, from my family to yours, from this congregation to yours, thank you, thank you, thank you. Until we talk again, take care, God bless. I wanted you to hear from those two pastors this morning before you hear from me. We had, as you saw, a team of about a dozen in Newfoundland on their spring break. And I promise you, when I was a teenager, when I was early in college, my spring break, I'm not going to do church stuff. I'm going to do Drew stuff. And a lot of us in this room could probably echo that. But God used these students. And let me tell you the fruit of what's happening. I was in a couple of conversations this past week. And it seems as though God is moving the state of Virginia, the part that we cooperate with, the Southern Baptist Conservatives of Virginia, to forming a partnership with Newfoundland. And our students here from Spotswood, and I know you always write off the next generation, our students from here at Spotswood are catalytic in this partnership as it looks as though it's actually going to be forming. So I wanted you to know how God has used you, but I also wanted you to know how God has used this group of teenagers in a place that a lot of us in this room will probably never see or go to make sure that the gospel is getting out in that community. So when you see one of our teenagers and whatever their hair looks like, or whatever their clothes look like, or whatever it is that they're doing, you need to thank God for them. Because a lot of us in this room are not gonna be here when they 
are driving the gospel into the lost part of the world and the nations. And I am very, very thankful for the foundation that they're getting here at Spotswood and that they are realizing it's not just about the senior adults or the older adults or the young adults. It's about me making sure I know who Jesus is and I take Jesus to people who need to know that Jesus is a king like no other king. Last December, we focused on the birth of Jesus and we focused on his life as a king as no other king. I had a burden. We needed to continue that as we celebrate Jesus as king, prophet, and priest. Those were three distinct roles in the Old Testament. Jesus fulfilled all of those roles in his life, in his ministry, in his death, burial, and resurrection. I shared with you a couple of weeks ago, when you read the Old Testament, as we're doing as a church this year, it's in the Old Testament that Jesus is predicted. And when you're spending time reading the New Testament, that's where Jesus is revealed. I encourage you, finish reading the Gospel of Luke this week. And if you're too far behind to catch up, or if you're here today visiting or maybe joining us online for the very first time, you didn't know we were reading the Gospel of Luke this month leading up to Easter, then here's what I want to encourage you to do. Start at Luke 19 and go through Luke 24. That will give you six chapters to read. So if you start today, you'll be finished next Saturday. And next Saturday is our first celebration, 6 p.m. here in this room of the Easter weekend. Now, I know you've heard me ask you this before. Pick up some of those cards and pass them out to your friends, to your neighbors, to your coworkers, and to your family members. I looked this morning in the foyer. I'm not positive if we have any more of those left, so here's what you can do. You can take a picture of that screen, and on your phone, you could just send that to somebody else if we're out of those cards. There are always ways to invite people to be here at Spotswood Easter weekend, 6 p.m. this coming Thursday. We have the Lord's Supper in our homes. That's online only. Make sure you pick up some of those supplies as you leave out today if you didn't get that last week. Friday night, you need to be here. We have a Good Friday service. And that service is built around our pastors reading scripture and us singing songs about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a contemplative kind of service. I remember the first time we did this. Somebody caught me after the service and, and asked, are we going to do that again? And I said, well, I know where they said, we need to. We really need to. So if you've been at one of these, be here Friday night. If you've never been, I really strongly encourage you to come. Saturday is our first celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. All things that happen this week at Spotswood are 6 p.m. Then next Sunday morning, we have our two regular scheduled services at 9.30 and 11. Many of you know that I have been serving on the president-CEO search of our Southern Baptist Convention trustees, our executive committee. And I am very thankful to let those of you who don't know, know that Dr. Jeff Orge, he's been here before, he's preached for me, he's been in our services before. He is retiring as president of Gateway Seminary in Ontario, California. And this past Thursday, he was unanimously elected to serve as president CEO of our executive committee. So what that means for me, yeah, I would, I'm very thankful. Listen, we had... We kind of had revival in that meeting in Dallas. They can even have revival in Dallas in a hotel, and that encouraged me. There were 60 in the room, and 60 voted yes. Some of the historians in the room could not remember a time in history, probably within at least 50 years, that a president CEO has been elected unanimously to serve as the president of our executive committee. So, my 10-month responsibility that started May of last year that engulfed my life is done. So I'm kind of celebrating that this morning, and I'm looking forward to having that big rock off of my plate and serving with Dr. Jeff Orge as our president and CEO. Back to these cards. I don't know how I got distracted. I'll blame you. But when it comes to inviting people, and I know you probably think he's always asking us to do that. He's always asking us to pass something out. Ah. Wish he'd stop. I ain't going to stop. But if you're thinking, here's my challenge for you. Because you know you have a relationship with at least one person 
who's not involved in the ministry of a local church, one person who may not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So here's, if, if you're not sure about passing out a card, taking a picture, sending that to somebody, putting it on your Facebook page or whatever, here's a prayer I want you to pray. Lord, should I give one of those cards, and then you put that person's name there. Lord, should I give one of those cards to, you just pray about it. So why would you ask me to pray about it? Because Henry Blackaby, who went to be with the Lord this past year, Henry Blackaby said, if you can't hear God speak, you're in trouble at the very heart of your relationship. So just pray, God, should I invite whatever that person's name is? God, should I send this to, should I get a card and hand it to and just see how God burdens your heart? Jesus as king, that was our focus last Sunday. And Jesus as king, a king like Noah the king, a king who outkings all kings, there's no limit to his authority. Jesus as prophet means that he is a spokesperson for God, that he speaks the truth of God. Next Sunday, Jesus as priest means that he reconciles us to God because a priest represents God to man and man to God. That's the journey that we started last Sunday. We continue today and we finish next Sunday. Now, I know church in the 21st century, when we hear the word prophet, we have a tendency to think, well, a prophet predicts the future. I thought, well, let's just walk through the life of Jesus for a few minutes and see whether or not he actually predicted the future and what he predicted, did it come true or not? So as a spokesperson for God, as someone who made predictions in his life and ministry, and you'll read about them in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus predicted his death and his resurrection. Now, we know that Jesus died, right? We also know that Jesus was resurrected. I, I take groups to Israel. I've been a number of times. I hope to take groups again. When we go to the garden tomb, we realize that we came all this way, paid all that money to see an empty tomb. It's as empty today as it was that first resurrection Sunday and how encouraging that is to us. So Jesus predicted his death and resurrection. That came true. Jesus also predicted his betrayal by Judas. That came true. We know that Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss. You read about that in the Gospels. We also know that Jesus predicted Peter's denials. Remember there in the garden, Jesus told his disciples to watch and pray so that they would not fall into temptation. And what did these men do? They fell asleep. And the, we already got it. Where was I? It, listen, Peter was not prepared for what he was about to face because he didn't listen to what Jesus said. Watch and pray. And if that happened to Peter, it'll happen to me, and it'll happen to you if you leave prayer out of your life. The thing is that when Peter realized he denied Jesus three times, he went out and he wept bitterly. And if you read the Gospel of John, Jesus restored Peter because Peter had a repentant heart. Jesus predicted Peter's denials. Jesus predicted the coming of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to read something out of John 16 in just a few minutes because I want you to hear what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit and not just what I said. Jesus also predicted the destruction of the temple. I'm reading through the Gospel of Luke with you. And this morning, I read Luke 21. And in Luke 21, you read those words about the destruction of the temple. Now, why would I surface all of these things as an introduction to a sermon? Well, everything that Jesus predicted that I just mentioned, these five, came true. Jesus also predicted his return. Now, think about this. If all of these other predictions came true... How could we go through life and think that this one's not going to come true? Now, I don't know when it's going to be. You don't know when it's going to be. Jesus himself said that he didn't even know, but only the Father in heaven 
Well, if everything Jesus said came true, I can't wait until this one's come true, because it will. Luke chapter 4, verse 14. I'm going to read a lengthy passage of Scripture this morning because I think it's really, really important for us to kind of get our minds set on Jesus as prophet. After his temptation, you know, he was baptized in the Jordan River. The Jordan River flows out of the Sea of Galilee. The traditional site of the baptism of Jesus is really far south from the city of Jerusalem and the Sea of Galilee. After he was baptized in the Jordan River, you know that he went through these temptations. He responded to every one of those challenges with Scripture, which is what we should do. We find him in the Galilee. Now, when, when you think about the nation of Israel, and there's a lot about the nation of Israel in our news right now, the Galilee is really in the northern part of the nation of Israel. So quite some distance from where he was, we find Jesus, Luke 4, in the Galilee. What's important about the Galilee? Well, in, in, in the first century, there, there were at least... 200 towns or small cities who historians believe had around 10,000 people. So if you do the math while Jesus is in the Galilee, he has the opportunity to preach the gospel to about 2,000 people. Not 2,000 people, excuse me, 2 million people. We'll probably have 2,000 on our campus next Sunday. But Jesus is preaching the gospel where the majority of the people lived in the Galilee. And as he's in the Galilee, verse 14, we're told that he's there in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread through all of the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues, and he was praised by all. So catch the backdrop. What we do with church planting, we go to cities, and churches, that's what's happening in Newfoundland. Jesus went to cities and synagogues. Paul, cities and synagogues. So we are following the example that they set. And then Jesus goes to Nazareth. Nazareth is where Jesus had been raised. Nazareth, first century, it's, it's just a little village. Probably had between 100 and 125 people. I don't know if you know this or not, but Nazareth is never mentioned in the Old Testament. As we read through the Old Testament, you're not going to find Nazareth mentioned. And, and you probably remember this at the beginning of the, of the ministry of Jesus. You can find this in John chapter 1. You remember when, when, when Philip went to Nathaniel and he said, we, we found the Messiah. And, and, and he tells him, it's Jesus of Nazareth, right? And what did Nathaniel say? Anything good come out of Nazareth? I mean, that's the attitude toward this little place. Nobody cared about. Nobody really knew anything about. And I, I've mentioned his name before, and a lot of you know him. This Jewish historian who lived a little bit after the time of Jesus to the end of the first century. He was not a follower of Jesus Christ. His name was Josephus. And Josephus wrote a lot of things about the history of the nation of Israel. And, and I've mentioned this to you before. If you have a problem with insomnia, read Josephus. I mean, it'll solve it. He never wrote anything about Nazareth. And as you read through the Gospels, as you learn about the life of Jesus, here's the sad part. This is the last time he ever visited his hometown. It's the last time he was ever in Nazareth. So keep that in context as you listen to what happened. He goes to the synagogue, and he stands up so that he could read the scroll for the day. And the word book is used here, but again, that's for us. It's a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. It was handed to him. We don't know if he asked for the scroll of Isaiah, or if that was the schedule for the day. So, so he opens the scroll, and he, he found the place where it was written, 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set those free who are oppressed. Verse 19, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And Jesus closed the book. He gave it to the attendant, and he sat down. Remember, in New Testament, in the synagogue, the teacher would sit, and everybody else would stand. How we got that thing reversed, I don't know. We're going to try it one Sunday here. So Jesus began to say to them, this is what he says. Because when he sits down and he's just read, they're all listening. Jesus said, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The prophet Isaiah, remember most quoted books in the New Testament, the book of Psalms and the book of Isaiah. So reading this quote, this is no coincidence, this is no accident, this is intentional on Jesus' part. And all were speaking well of him. The first, verse 22, Luke 4. They were wondering at the gracious words that were falling from his lips. And they're saying, isn't this Joseph's son? And Jesus begins kind of elaborating on the scripture. Verse 23, no doubt you're going to quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. That happened. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your own hometown as well. They challenged Jesus with that. You know it. Verse 24, he said, truly I say to you, no prophet's welcome in his own hometown, but I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months and there was a great famine. Yet here's the thing, Elijah was sent to none of them, but, but to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. That would have made her a Gentile. And he's speaking to the Jews. There's a tremendous amount of hatred between Jews and Gentiles. Verse 27, there are a lot of lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet. None of them were cleansed. Just Naaman the Syrian. Again, he would have been a Gentile. Now, they, they've said... It's incredible. This is Joseph's son. Small village, 100, 125. They probably knew the whole family situation, all the story. And when he mentions these two examples in his sermon, all of the people in the synagogue, they were filled with rage when they heard these things. So they got up and they drove him out of the city. They led him to the brow of the hill that their city had been built on because they wanted to throw him off of that brow. I've seen it, been there. But Jesus just passed through their midst and he went his way. Why so angry with Jesus? Well, prefacing the sermon that he preaches is this perspective that this is, this is Joseph's son. And, and this is a challenge for our culture, our world today. What they did is they humanized Jesus. They didn't see him as God's son. They saw him as Joseph's son. And if Jesus was just a man, then we have some unsolvable problems. No ordinary man can save you from your sins. But listen, the Bible consistently reveals that Jesus was no ordinary man. What you see happening here is a group of people who become very dismissive of Jesus. Remember our talk last Sunday about three different groups? You've got those who are antagonistic. You've got those who are indifferent. Then you have those who are people of faith. As I said last Sunday, I don't think indifference really a category, but when I was preparing for our time together today, focus on Jesus as the prophet, what really made sense for me is if you're dismissive of Jesus, it's easy to be indifferent. Or maybe it's, it's easy to be angry. And maybe, maybe today there's some people in the room or there's some people who are joining us online and Deep down inside, just to be honest, you know, you're, you're just kind of, you're just kind of angry with Jesus. Maybe your life hadn't gone the way you think your life should have gone. 
You've tried to fix it. You've tried to figure it out. You can't. You're just angry. So what I'd like to do is kind of diagnose the problem of being angry with Jesus, not necessarily on a personal level, but on a macro level, because I think this applies across the board. All of us, either now or at some time in our life, all of us have two problems that we cannot solve. The first one's our sin problem. And the second one is our significance problem. And, and I want to take these two in reverse order. When it comes to our significance, when, when, when life starts going the way that we never expected it to go, I think it's important for me to remind you and really anyone who's paying attention online or maybe watching later online at some point in the future. You can't figure God out. According to the Bible, and remember the Bible is our source book for truth and every religion in the world has some source book for truth. So we're just being consistent with the world. Our belief is the Bible's the word of God and it is our source of truth. So what we do when we can't figure God out and our life's not really going the way we thought our life should go, we turn to scripture. And what I would encourage you to do is in the New Testament, find Romans chapter 3. And read Romans chapter 3, because when you get to verse 10 and verse 11 of Romans chapter 3, here's, here's what you're going to find, and this is just kind of a quick paraphrase. There's no one in this world who really understands God. Really, there are very few people here in the world who actually seek God. None of us are perfect. And the reason we don't seek God, the reason we're not perfect, the reason we can't figure out God on our own is our brains just aren't big enough. I know mine's not. Our staff spent some time this past week listening to Convocation at Liberty, September of last year, by Gabe Lyons. It was something that I found a few months ago because I'm just kind of on a journey right now trying to figure out this whole artificial intelligence thing. One of my good friends and I had lunch this past week. He bought, I ate, uh, Miracle. But we talked about this whole thing, artificial intelligence. And when, when Gabe Lyons was talking about the challenge of, of artificial intelligence, he made a statement that just resonated with my heart. Our, our brains are actually shrinking because we rely too much on technology. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear a statement like that, I'm like, where'd you get that from? So that sends me on a search, and, and the search that I went on, I found that the National Institute of Health has also pointed this out. That the frontal lobe of our brains, because we're depending so much on technology, they're actually shrinking. I found an article in Psychology Today. Listen to this. There's a term. It's called gray matter atrophy. So, so what we're doing is we are actually playing into the hands of our adversary, the devil. We don't realize that we're not going to figure God out. We're not going to find God on our own. We have to go to Scripture. And, and if we rely on technology to the void of Scripture, we're going to miss out on the hope and the truth that we need about the person and work of Jesus Christ. Something else that I found this past week, searching. There's something called the electronic screen syndrome. Now I'm going to read this to you because you might know someone who has it. People who have electronic screen syndrome because of the amount of time that they spend using technology, they're irritable, they're moody, they lose their temper quickly, they fly into fits of rage, they have real, real low self-esteem. 
When everybody's doing some type of activity, they don't want to participate in that activity. In fact, they live their life with this feeling, this sense of hopelessness. You can't solve that problem for yourself. Now, only Jesus can solve our problem of wondering, does my life count? A am I here for a reason? I is there anything of eternal significance for me to do? Well, the answer is yes, but the sin problem has to be solved first. I said I was going to take these two in reverse. So, so how is the sin problem solved? Well, the answer, remember I said I was going to read John 16, verse 8 in just a second? Jesus predicted the coming of the Holy Spirit, and he's here. He's active in the room. He's active in your mind. He's active in your heart. He's active in your conversations if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. But if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, he's also active. Now, I could share with you some incredible thoughts from this sermon, but what I want you to do is hear what Jesus said. John 16, verse 8, Jesus said, And he, the reference to he is the Holy Spirit. When he comes, listen to what the Holy Spirit does. He will convict the world concerning sin. Do you kind of have that feeling down inside? You kind of realize something's wrong with my life and I don't know why this is going on? That's the Holy Spirit convicting you. Every Sunday when I finish the sermon, I encourage you, go talk to someone to the next step station. Let me have a conversation with you. Why? Because it may be that the Holy Spirit is actually convicting you of sin in your life. And, and you don't know how to fix that. You don't know how to respond to that. We want to help you biblically. We want to encourage you. When the Holy Spirit begins to work, he convicts you of sin, righteousness. You know your life doesn't measure up. Judgment. And then Jesus expands on that concerning sin because you don't believe in me. You know, we, we always get this list of sins. Well, I've, at least I hadn't done murdered any. It, but do you believe in Jesus? I'm talking about to the fact that he directs everything about your life. You've turned from you and you've turned to Jesus. You believe in him. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of the world has been judged. See, when you read the scripture and we're reading Old Testament, I want you to read the Gospel of Luke, at least chapters 19 through 24. You are convicted of sin when you read the Word of God. It would be horrible on God's part to convict us and just leave us there. But one of the greatest messages of hope is found in the Gospel of Luke, which is why I'm asking you to read the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 19, verse 10, here's what Jesus said. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. You can't figure God out. You're not looking for God. God is looking for you. Because you can't solve your sin problem. And, and you can't solve this, I feel like my life just doesn't matter, hopeless. You can't fix that. But God can make you brand new. Because here's the thing. Is Jesus a prophet? Absolutely he's a prophet. But Jesus is more than a prophet. Jesus, Jesus is the greatest hope ever. That's who Jesus is. And everything about Jesus reveals God. When you read the Bible, when you attend worship, when you sing songs, when you listen to sermons, here's the thing. You don't do that for information only. What God does is he reveals himself to you through all of these different vehicles. And as God reveals himself to you, especially through the word, he promised his word is going to bring about what he purposed from beginning to end. Now, I don't know if you knew this or not, but when Jesus read Psalm 61 and gave that scroll back to the attendant. He stopped in the middle of verse 2. He didn't, he didn't continue. 
So what I want to do, and, and, and we're done. I want to read Psalm 61, verse 2. Because there's something here that we need to hear. Psalm 61, verse 2. To proclaim, this is what Jesus was there to do, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And here's the last part. And the day of vengeance of our God. You see, right now, You've heard this from me and you've heard it from others. Right now, we're living in what's called the age of grace. It's it's our opportunity to respond to the king, the prophet, the priest, Jesus. And we respond because of grace. But but the age of grace, it's not going to last forever. And, And remember, Jesus, with all of these predictions, he predicted his return. That's going to happen. And when Jesus returns that day in a moment, in an instant, that ends the, in the age of grace, and it begins the age of judgment. Now, when I receive that gift of salvation, in that very moment, for eternity, I'm going to miss the judgment of God. I'm not going to be judged. My wife, Judy, is is not going to be judged. Pastor, how do you know that? Because on the cross, the king and the prophet and the priest, Jesus, satisfied the wrath of God. When he took my place, he took the wrath of God against sin, because we're all sinners. He took the wrath of God in my place. But what I had to do was turn away from trying to figure my life out, trying to do my thing my way. I had to turn away from that, and I had to turn to the person of Jesus Christ. My sin was forgiven, and my significance was changed forever. My significance is not based on what I do, who I am. My significance is based on the fact that I'm a child of God. I'm a blood-bought, redeemed follower of Jesus Christ. That's significance. That is significance in life that nothing can take from you and no one can stop. That's significance. When I talked about Jesus being king, I said he has authority without limits. What I need to ask you today is have you come under the authority of that king? And have you heard the truth of the prophet of God, Jesus Christ, when he said, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. All of us in the room, every person joining us online, one of those three groups. You're antagonistic toward Jesus. Who does he think he is? My life's a mess. Who's that pastor think he is? You're antagonistic. Or maybe you're just dismissive. He was just a man. There are five major religions in our world. Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism. Of those five major world religions, it is only biblical Christianity that presents Jesus as the Son of God. Sinless, crucified, buried, resurrected, and returning Redeemer. It is biblical Christianity, and that's it. You may be dismissive of Jesus because you don't believe that Jesus really is the Son of God, or either you're a person of faith. I pray that you are a person of faith. If you are not, today's the day. Please go to that next step station. Talk to one of our pastors. Talk to one of our volunteers and see how you can move in this age of grace before judgment happens from death to life. Father, thank you for the privilege this morning of just walking through such an important passage of Scripture. God, a lot of us in this room have read through Luke 4. A lot of this was just review. But Lord, it may be for someone here in the room, first time. Now they know, man, there's something I need to do. My life's a mess, and I don't have enough brains to figure this thing out. I have a sin problem. 
Jesus had been saying that over and over and over and over and over and over. It's your opportunity. Put your faith in Jesus today. Move out of whatever group you're in to that group of faith. Father, I pray you have your will in these moments, this hour, in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Altar's always open. You can come anytime, pray. I want to come and pray right now. You may want to go talk to someone about joining the church or becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. Salvation. You have to sing this song. You can go right now. Judy and I will be over in the blue room. Love to pray with you, meet you. New here, love to meet you. Sing with me, church. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. My cross I'll carry till I see Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back.